Welcome to Three Men in a Mystery. I'm John Lorton. I'm Mike Morford. And I'm Gray Hughes. Today is the season finale, and if you thought that we brought you a bunch of new information last episode, buckle up, because we have even more coming today, including the latest updates on the case status from Allison's mother, Misty. But before we get to that... All three of us were able to interview someone that's been working on the front lines of the Allison Watterson case, the family's private investigator, Michael O'Connell. My name is, <clears throat> excuse me, Michael O'Connell. I worked for the Washington County Sheriff's Office here in Oregon for 30 years and three months. Um, I spent seven of those years on patrol and the next 23 in detectives. I retired in 2010 um, as a detective sergeant. I was uh, in charge of the violent crimes team. Uh, for a while, I was also in charge of the child abuse unit. And then I've had my uh, private investigator's license since uh, December of 2010. Misty had been inquiring of several people about a, a PI that might be helpful. And uh, I was recommended to her by... Um, a former judge and a lieutenant with Hillsboro PD and a couple other people. And then she called me and we met and it went from there. I'm also just curious, did you happen to know any of the people that are involved in this case prior because of your work with the department? Yeah, somewhat. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Western Washington County and um, I'm actually related to some of the folks that distantly related some of the folks that um, live up in the Pumpkin Ridge area. We're really having trouble understanding the whole party that went on. Can you share with us what was going on there at that party? It's It's been said it's a, it was a barbecue type party. Can you shed some light on that? A barbecue, a barbecue is probably a bit overstated, but basically they spent two days up there with some friends very near, <clears throat> very near to where Allison's remains were ultimately located. Are we talking like a house party of 40 people, or is this a half dozen people? Oh, it's less than that. I I can't imagine that it was ever any larger than half a dozen. I think it was mostly just four to five. It was a very small gathering. Yeah, One of the things you have to remember is that you know, anything that comes from Ben Garland yeah, should be really looked at, you know, with a great deal of scrutiny, in my opinion. Well, he just wasn't uh, being truthful. Uh, for instance, when he was found in the back of uh, the pickup owned by Ralph, um, he didn't tell Ralph about Allison, that Allison was missing. We've heard so many different stories from Ben, and it seems like the stories are always kind of an angle for him to get something that he's looking for. Um, yeah, I, I don't think any of us disagree that there's just too many stories flying around this guy for it. It can't all be the truth, obviously. But on top of that, exactly. yeah, on top of that, we're also wondering a little bit about Charlie. Uh, originally when Gray started looking into this, he actually had a little contact with Charlie and then that kind of seemed to trail off. We've also got this bizarre thing where the truck that's stolen actually winds up on Charlie's property. Have you found Charlie to, been co to be cooperative in all this? I, I actually have. Um, I interviewed him twice. Uh, one of the interviews uh, was recorded and um, I found him to be pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's just in it's interesting that the you know she's found near that area, you know, like right over the fence, basically. Yeah, it is interesting. And then another thing that I still can't justify or square in my head is that if she was last seen up closer to on a, a dirt road, kind of in the woods. And then she worked her way downhill, which she, we know she did. And we know that's very common of lost or distressed people. Why did she pass Charlie and Courtney's house? 
why was she found beyond there? It just does, that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, why didn't she just go back to where the barbecue was? It's right there. One of the few places that she's actually familiar with. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, apparently she didn't know that area well, but still, if she'd spent two days at Charlie and Courtney's, and, you know, instinct kicks in, and you know, she eventually, at one point, you would have thought when she was trying to find help that um, she would have said, "Oh, that's Charlie's house," or she would have at least, even if she didn't realize it was Charlie and Courtney's. She would have seen lights on at the house, and if she was in distress, you would have thought she would have gone there. Do we know if anyone was at the house at that time? I mean, considering that supposedly Charlie was gone, was someone else there? Yes, Courtney was there. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the strange interaction at the firehouse? They said they were held up at knife point, and the police were called, but they didn't ID Ben at the time. So we don't know that they were ever really robbed. We know there was some kind of drug, uh, supposed to be a drug transaction, shortly before the contact at the fire department. But we don't know for certain that, that they were robbed. In fact, the follow-up done on that contact, um, done by the sheriff's office, indicates that it was not a robbery. Was it, was it a drug deal that they were doing before that, Michael? Yes. Okay. And Ben certainly told his mother that he had been robbed. But when that was followed up, it, it didn't pan out. Yeah, actually, the location where the drug transaction or attempted drug transaction took place was between the fire station and where Ben lived. Yeah, and then somehow they end up at the fire station... To use their phone. It's just, it's so, yeah. it's so bizarre, you know? Like, So one of the stories, speaking of Ben and his stories, is obviously the one about him uh, supposedly sleeping in blackberry bushes. Can you just give us your thoughts and insights on that story? That's probably true, at least part of the night. I mean, the area up there is, there are acres and acres of very thick uh, blackberry bushes. Eventually, he worked his way to Ralph's pickup. But, yeah, there are, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he had to spend part of the night in blackberry bushes. I think he told his mother that. Um, and then the area where Allison was ultimately found is also thick, tall, berry briars. And is that, like... If if you were out in the, that area like that at that time of night, would there be any particular reason why you would choose that to sleep in as opposed to just laying out on some grass under the sky? No. Okay. Unless you were paranoid from meth use. Um, and let's say you thought you were being hunted by someone or thought the police were after you. You may have dove into the berry briars to hide, but would a, would a normal person, even in distress or lost up there, burrow into the berry briars? No. And he told his mother that they were both convinced that they were being hunted by the police at that time up on Pumpkin Ridge. Now, the fact, the, the reality is that there were no police up there at that time. Um, but if the meth paranoia kicked in, they could have believed that. Bill Gaden had a, has a German shepherd that apparently was barking, and Ben told his mother that Allison said she was going to turn herself into the police, convinced that the dog that was barking was a police dog. Now, at that point, yeah, they'd stolen the pickup, but it hadn't even been reported to the police yet. There were no police up there looking for him at that time. So again, it's the whole meth paranoia that really messes everything up. And how do you think the backpack got in the middle of that field? Because I saw where that was located too. And it's like, there's a fence that goes all the way around it. 
you'd have to climb a fence, then just leave it in the field, then climb over another fence, and then walk um, up Pumpkin Ridge Road to Sally's house. Yeah, I don't know other than, you know, there's no direct trail that I know of anyway from where they stashed the truck up to the top of the hill. So they had to have been walking through fields and, um, you know, I assume trying to avoid the thick berry briar patches on that route, but that would have been, that would have been quite a hike. And yeah, it, your point is uh, well taken. You know, if, if she didn't have shoes on at that point or didn't have decent shoes, would have made it even more difficult. Uh, she had to have been just exhausted and, you know, at her wit's end once they reached the top of the hill. Yeah, and you, you mentioned that it was quite a hike because literally that was leading into my next question. Early reports said that they were out there hiking. Is that an area where you normally find people going for a hike? Absolutely not. I saw the area, the exact area where her remains were found. And it, if you were to see it, it strikes you in one of two ways. Some people interpret it as, well, this looks like a logical place for her to try to seek at least a small, small bit of shelter. The way this, uh, these briars and the, the brush was formed, it almost looked like something you might want to crawl into if you're trying to get, you know, somewhat out of the rain, etc. But on the other hand, it also strikes you as somewhere where a body might be placed by someone who didn't want it to be found. So it, it cuts both ways. Um, how did you find out about Allison being found? One of the things, you know, I'm disappointed that I wasn't able to accomplish more for Misty and for Allison. But one of the things I was able to accomplish was um, getting the major crimes team in Washington County involved. Um, and I had met with them. Uh, I had taken two of them, Detective Dresser and Detective uh, Purdy, on kind of a tour, showing them all the locations. Because they, they were, you know, they came into this cold. And, you know, it's a pretty confusing and complex story. So I kind of helped them, you know, get started and show them the various locations, et cetera. And because I had worked with those guys for years and I was the coordinator of the major crimes team when they were involved in it, and they were two of the very best and still are two of the very best detectives in the county, um, I had a relationship with them and uh, Detective Dresser notified me when she was found. And and I think you maybe touched on it earlier and, and started to just again, uh, is that an area where her remains were found that someone would uh, be able to get to uh, without crawling into it or, or somehow uh, uh, really trying hard to get in, into it? That's a difficult question. Um, I don't think it would be easy, but, you know, there are, uh, there's a number of people that, you know, know that area very well and uh, have um, access to different kinds of vehicles, but it wouldn't be easy, no, not even to place her there. Um, one of the things that I want to do is I want to see what, even though the brush in the immediate area where Allison was found has been cleared. You know, the area around it is pretty much identical. And uh, I'm interested in seeing what it looks like, you know, in December. Um, you know, have the leaves all fallen off? And is it, you know, easier to see or to get through? I just don't know. But I, I plan on revisiting the area. You think it's possible that one person could have moved her there had she been placed there? Uh, it's possible. Less likely, but possible. We did hear that Molly stated that she had noticed when Ben got home that he had peed himself. 
Did did you ask her about that? Um, I don't know. I didn't directly ask her, but that did come up. She did tell me that he was uh, wet and cold. And apparently when he was standing by the stove to warm himself, he realized that from the smell of the urine that he had heat himself and she had him change clothes. Yeah. I actually reached out to some experts that we had on last season. Um, forensic psychologist from LA not so confidential and uh, Dr. Shiloh sent me a response. I asked her specifically about this. Like, is it known for someone that may have committed a violent act for them to have peed themselves? Uh, this is her response. During fight or flight situations, the sympathetic nervous system gets activated to help us get moving. Think major extremities and muscles to run or tense up to take on pain. Basically, the body starts prioritizing what you absolutely need versus what it can get rid of. And if the body senses a dangerous situation, the bowels and bladder can empty. We'll continue with Michael O'Connell right after this short break. Do you love true crime podcasts but could do without the chatty banter? Are you intrigued by what's underneath our collective true crime obsession and want to hear field experts, authors, and content creators weigh in on the matter? Well, it might be time for you to kill the small talk and join the dialogue. I'm Rebecca Sebastian, host of Dialogue, a true crime conversation. It's a weekly podcast where I speak with fascinating guests from the true crime world and the criminal justice system. Together, we explore the genre itself and attempt to answer the why of true crime and also the question, what are we even talking about when we talk about true crime? Join me every Wednesday for a new episode and a killer conversation. Dialogue is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back and please keep in mind that our sponsors are helping us raise funds that will go towards investigating this case further. So please show them the same support they're showing us Let's continue learning more about the case with private investigator, Michael O'Connell. And then another thing uh, that I wanted to mention was that when Ben shows back up, just, you know, shortly before he gets arrested at Courtney's with uh, the stolen pickup, he is talking very bizarre in a very bizarre manner to Courtney. He is saying things like, You need to pack up your kids uh, and get out of here. The shit's going to hit the fan. Stuff like that. And, you know, Courtney didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And then he wanted Courtney to go with him. I'm not sure where. And she had the sense to refuse. She also had her... um, child she was taken care of but he was uh he was out there way out there mentally you know my instincts told me and still tell me that it's all centers around ben and that if anybody else is involved it's someone that he may have enlisted to help him but all this other stuff about you know being stalked or being chased by the owner of the pickup or being chased by, uh, um, well, there was another fellow whose name I couldn't remember. There, uh, Misty thought maybe he had something to do with it for a while. I just don't, you know, a lot of time was spent both by myself and the sheriff's detectives, major crimes team, looking into those issues and they, they just didn't pan out. I think it uh, all comes right back to Ben. And, you know, that's often the case. You know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I've had cases where, you know, lots of uh, elaborate theories were proposed. And and it always comes down to the basics. You know, the last person to see the victim alive is most of the time, I'd say, in the 98th percentile the person that caused them harm, if harm was caused, um, or they know something, either wittingly or unwittingly, about what happened. Okay, what, what are some of, the, um, some of the inconsistencies in Ben's statements 
that you find particularly challenging? Well, just the whole story of she was going to turn herself into the to the police. In fact, it, she may have. I can't remember. Anyway, there was some indication that she was going to turn herself in to the police dog, that that could just be someone's phrasing. But that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the hours that went by between when Ben certainly knew she was missing and then even his parents ultimately learned from him that she was missing and was up there. Um, the hours that went by, not only before they notified Allison's mother, Misty, but before they even notified the police. In fact, uh, Bill Gaden deserves a lot of credit. Um, Gaden had contact with Ben when Ben resurfaced with the pickup um, on Charlie's property. And Gaden was questioning him about why, where are the police and why haven't they been notified or have they been notified? And Ben's telling him no. And Gaden is a no nonsense, salt of the earth, a pretty direct guy. And he starts boring down on, uh, or bearing down on and saying, okay, why haven't you called the police? What, what do you mean you haven't called the police? And Ben kind of whispers to him that uh, he has a warrant. And Mr. Gaden, in effect, says, I don't care if you have a warrant or not. Either you call them, your dad calls them, or I'm going to call them. And he was pretty direct and uh, hard on him about this issue, rightfully so. And um, that's when ultimately Ben's dad did notify the sheriff's office. But if, if if Bill Gaden hadn't, you know, realized something's wrong here and hadn't been as direct as he was, who knows how many more hours would have gone by before the police were notified. I think it all settles back on Ben's shoulders. And even if Ben is not ever criminally held liable, to me, he's, he's morally liable, in my opinion. I mean, what kind of person would leave his girlfriend up there and then seek help for himself by crawling into Ralph's pickup and you know, not saying anything to Ralph about Allison? Um, it's just he's going to have to live with his own conscience, and I... I wouldn't want to be in his shoes for the rest of his life. I think the thing that's going to make it tough is all everything we're hearing about this weekend. First of all, you've got the the kind of meth mania that you're referring to. We've got the actions not making a whole lot of sense. So obviously there probably wasn't a lot of premeditation in terms of what could have happened to end her life. And when you don't have premeditation, you don't have all that planning and all that without all that planning, I think it kind of closes up the investigation quite a bit, right? It does. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Well, uh, Michael, we really appreciate your time today. Um, Can you tell us how people that might like to hire you, how they can find you? It's M-J-O dot investigations plural ending in an s at gmail.com excellent yeah we really appreciate you thank you so much for spending time with us and thank you for all the help that you brought to misty um she's obviously someone that we're getting closer to as we've been producing this show she and uh she and billy they are wonderful and uh i feel so bad for misty nobody should have to uh go through you know what she went through and um there have been changes at the sheriff's office since i left that i don't agree with uh, sh- should have never been allowed to happen but 
I no longer have any influence over that, but that made it unnecessarily difficult for her. And uh, anyway. Michael's interview ends with a lot of new questions and seemingly some doubt about the leadership of the investigation. We know Misty is already dealing with a lot in the loss of her daughter and a search for justice. But what other challenges are facing her now? I spoke to her to find out. Hi, Misty, and thanks for coming on and discussing Allison's case with us. Hi, uh, thanks for having me on. appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. And I, I first wanted to say on behalf of John, Gray, and myself, we wanted to pass our condolences to you and your family. Uh, I know Thank when you. we first talked to you earlier this year, I think it was spring, about doing the podcast, mm -hmm. Allison was missing. And since then, unfortunately, she was found deceased back in June. How have you been holding up these last uh, few months? Um, well, you know, it's, um, it's been a really um, horrific time. I mean, you know, um, I really held out hope that she would come home. And, you know, I, as horrible as it may sound, it, you know, I was really holding on to the fact that maybe somebody had her and, and then they would let her go. Um, you know, and obviously that's not the case. That wasn't the case. And, um, you know, it's just, it's been a, it's been a hard time. You know, uh, I think right after we found her, they found her, um, you know, we had a funeral for her and that kind of kept my mind busy for a little while. And then, you know, after that was done, kind of the dust settled and then, you know, then I had my time to start grieving, you know, um, it, it's, it's pretty touch and go. I have, I have my decent days and, you know, but every second of every day I just think about her and, and miss her like just horribly, you know, she was just such a big part of our lives and, um, such a huge presence in our lives and such an amazing woman that, you know, the loss of her has been very profound. Um, you know, trying to learn how to live without her and, you know, um, just, it's just been horrible to be honest with you. And, and I remember when we talked the first time you were very optimistic, you were very hopeful that she was out there someplace and, and somehow would be found safe and yeah. obviously this is the worst outcome as a parent that there could be right um right have you how have you dealt with the transition of wondering where mm -hmm. allison was to now wondering what happened to her and does that open up a new uh set of questions and, and concerns and, and things that you're thinking about well sure i mean you know the the fact that she was where she was found you know um, search and rescue, um, you know, she was found in a, in a huge bunch of blackberry bushes under a, like a kind of under a tree. And, you know, when, when we were out there with search and rescue after they found her, you know, I, my question to the search and rescue commander was like, why didn't you guys go in here? And he said, well, there, the area was unpenetrable. And I said, well, obviously it's not, she got in there somehow, you know, either, was put there or went there herself who knows you know um so you know i do have a lot of questions and i you know i believe that um ben garland knows exactly what happened to her and you know how she lost her life and you know we we've got nothing from his family or him on that aspect and you know i'm not i'm not trying to commit a, like invent a crime if there wasn't one i just want to know what happened to my daughter i just want to know how she lost her life you know it's we, the, the area that she they found her search and rescue actually searched right by there and we did as well too you know you could you wouldn't even believe how close we were to her you know when we look at the maps of where we had searched it, it's just it's it's just insane how close everybody was but yet nobody went in there because of all the blackberry bushes so and we hadn't actually gotten permission from the property owner yet to search there. That was on the list. But, you know, um, I honestly, I'm glad somebody else found her. I don't know what life would look like today if I had been the one to found her or our, our search team. Um, 
you know, I just, I think that would be a whole other set of trauma that, you know, nobody would want to go through. So. And, and you do bring up a very good point, that area. We've seen video of it and uh, we talk a, a lot about it in the podcast. It is a very mm-hmm. hard to get, uh, hard to get to place and that it doesn't seem like somebody right. would willingly go on their own. Um, yeah. So it, it does seem to open up a, a new bunch of questions. Well, if she didn't go on her own, why would she go there? And if she didn't, who brought her there? Um, right. When you mentioned getting that awful news, what did they tell you early on? Did, did they know anything? Did they share anything with you about what they knew, what they didn't know? You know, they um, they shared a few things like, what, you know, that where her clothes had been found and um, just kind of the state of her remains. Um, you know, there was really nothing left of her, just bones. So, um, you know, that was kind of a definitely a mystery to them as well. Um, you know, the lead investigator, um, you know, really kept trying to just put it in our heads that, oh, um it seems like it's hypothermia because um, her sweatshirt was found like, um, like she had taken it off. So it was inside out, Um, you know, and apparently that's one of the signs of hypothermia is that, you know, right before a person dies from it, they, um, they, uh, they get like really hot and their skin feels very prickly. And so they actually start stripping down their clothes. Um, it's just an effect of hypothermia, I guess, is what he said. Um, and so they were really focused on that hypothermia, hypothermia, hypothermia. And so, um, you know, when the medical examiner came out there, you know, and they took a few months to, to, you know, come up with their cause of death, that's what they ultimately said was hypothermia. And the only reason why they said that, I'm actually in the process of, um, I'm, you know, having that re-looked at because there is no other information. There's no other, nothing else to tell them that it was hypothermia. And in fact, there was such little information, I would believe that it would be undetermined. And the lead detective stated that as well. However, I know that the medical examiner really went they do, they go a lot off of what the detectives say. And I believe, honestly, it's just pure laziness on their part. And they, you know, it's like, oh, we found her. Oh, case closed. You know, there was nothing wrong with her bones. So, you know, now we're not going to do an investigation. And that's where it fits today is that they've, they've washed their hands of it because they believe You know, they just don't want to investigate. And he told me that unless some information basically falls in their lap and they can run it down, they're not going to continue to investigate what happened to her. So So, based on the remains, and and maybe this is a question Mm -hmm. if you're going to get a medical exam or a second opinion as far as that goes. But Mm -hmm. is there anything to tell, uh, like nick marks on a bone uh sometimes you can tell someone's been strangled even though they have skeletal remains right anything like that that can be uh as far as you know or you plan to look into that can be told by her remains right so that is what they would um that's what they look for to see if it was homicide um and there was none of that you know um is what they say Well, guys, I don't know about you, but um, I think shocked and disappointed pretty much sums up where I'm at with this. Uh, I'm really struggling with the hypothermia call, Uh, the paradoxical undressing. This thing comes up over and over and over in these cases, and I've never heard of it used in this way. She took off her sweater, so that means she was paradoxically undressed. I, I, I had, I just haven't heard of it that way. I've heard of it where all the clothing's been removed, but not just she took off a sweater. And how do they know she took the sweater off? And it was on, it was on again inside out. So what, if you're paradoxical undressing, you would, you're not going to put it back on again. 
Right? Well, I mean, your, your, your mind's out there. You're taking it off. You know? Yeah. And even the, the, the hypothermia thing, we're not talking about her being in the Alps. This, this right. is a populated area. It's not normal for someone in their 20s to stay in a place where they're literally going to freeze to death when all they have to do is make their way to a nearby home and ask for help. It just, the, the logic around it, I'm, I'm really, really struggling with. Obviously, uh, even though she didn't call this out, it sounds like they've flagged it essentially as an accidental death. That's what that sounds like. You know, I, I don't know if you guys remember but the Kanika Jenkins case, they were all saying paradoxical undressing because the shoe was off. You know, right. and her blouse was up, but in reality, that's how everything was loose while she was walking around. So I don't even think it was even in that case, even though that was a situation where you think it would exist. The thing is, is it's not really even that common. It does happen. It's a known thing, but it's not like 95% of the time people do that, you know? Yeah. Morph, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> I just, uh, I'm, everything's just spinning for me as I'm re visiting everything here that we've talked about this season the i i can't see her going out there on her own willingly I, i'm still having a problem with that uh and and the difficulty of getting there and then as you just said if it's if she's that cold and she's going to freeze to death she's got to walk out out of those bushes and across that field and she's literally within sight of homes uh so i just uh, there's something going on. I, I can't put my finger on it. I, I get the feeling that, um, and I don't want to use best case, worst case, because there is no best case here, but uh, at best, uh, maybe she did die some way, and we can speculate all day long about how, and, and possibly in a panic, someone wanted to distance themselves from her and they discarded her there. Or, you know, worst case, someone harmed her and caused her death and put her out there. I, I, I think I, I just don't see her willingly going there and, and laying down and just saying, I'm going to stay here and just freeze to death. It just doesn't add up to me. Well, where she was found is over a fence too, a barbed wire fence into a really, you know, blackberry infested tree. You know, there's some trees and it's sort of like an umbrella shaped tree and then she's found in there. But the thing is, if you go to the property that's on the other side of the fence, there's trees that you could hide under. It's got trees there, too. And that's closer to where the barbecue was. I don't see any reason why somebody would go over a blackberry, I mean, a, a barbed wire fence into some blackberry bushes and then crawl under a tree and then just stay there. That doesn't make any sense to me. And for me, it comes back full circle to Ben. Ben's in those same blackberry bushes. He's placing himself in blackberry bushes. So I, I, I feel something happened. And uh, I, I, I agree with, with the detective. I agree with her mom that he's responsible. He, he one way or another, whether he did something intentionally, whether he didn't aid in some way of, of getting her help, um, her being left out there, I think, falls in his lap. Yeah, it's it's strange because it really seems like at the end of that interview we did with Michael that he was kind of leading towards like, yeah, you know, these other guys are kind of coming in and there's nothing I can do about it. And then we hear this from Misty. Um, it's very, very disappointing. And I think it's unfair to make a call like that. Uh, to, to her point, how do you prove that this is hypothermia. There's no soft tissue left. So you're you're basically basing this on how you found, and as it's described by her at least, we're talking about one article of clothing. This isn't like in the Elisa Lamb case where all of her clothes are found in the water tank and they're all off of her body. And her body is still whole, so we know that something happened where she or someone removed all the clothing. Um, this is a completely different situation. I would. I would real. I really wish we had some better analysis in terms of the rest of the clothing. Was it found around the bones? What's the status of that? Is there any of that that captured some of the decomposition? Could that be analyzed in some way? Is there some hair left behind that some testing can be done to see if there's possibly some narcotics or something that are at play here? 
there's it just seems to me that there's a lot of other things that could have been done, but it feels like they want to just close this file and move it off their desk, at least to hear it described by Misty. And, you know, we're not hearing from them, obviously. So it's, uh, so it's sort of become it's sort of becoming a common theme. You know, how many cases have we seen with this exact same thing? Yeah. And this app, I mean, this one isn't even undetermined. They're probably just going to say, oh, it's an accidental death, death due to hypothermia. Whenever there's drugs involved somehow, it seems like they kind of quickly go to a, a, a ruling that they don't have to keep working on it. It's not going right. to be undetermined. It'll be some sort of accidental because they don't want to put, I don't know, I don't want to disparage police. I mean, I love police. Okay. But it's just sometimes it feels like they put those on a lower level because of the type of case it turned out to be. Yeah. It's like the old um, adage that sex workers, for example, their cases don't get as much attention as a, a college girl that goes missing and is, is found uh, murdered right across the street from where a sex worker could be murdered. There's there's like a, a double standard. And I think that in this kind of case when you've got like a crew of known quote unquote druggies or that crowd anyone associated with them i think they maybe get put on a back burner and and they don't get the the uh, uh a plus uh investigation not not all the times again i don't want to condemn this police department because i don't know uh, what what they've done exactly but we do know that that happens sometimes uh the the main thing i'm struggling with is could hypothermia have been a factor in this death? Absolutely. But I'm still stuck on the fact that she was in a populated area. She's literally on property that belongs to somebody. And is there something else that incapacitated her to the point of hypothermia overtaking her? That's that's really where I'm stuck. And to just say hypothermia, that's it, you know, cause identified, case closed. I don't think is is fair to the case, especially with all the information that they have about what's happened in this case. So, and you, and it goes back to too if 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 someone didn't physically end her life, they didn't murder her, but they allowed her to die. There's still some some wrongdoing there. Yeah. Um, so at the very least, if that is the case, there's there's more to the story than her just walking out, laying down and dying on her own that, there. Uh, Misty tells us about how she's going to try to move forward from here. I am in the process of still trying to get them to give me the paperwork because I would like to see exactly how they came to that conclusion. Um, I don't buy it. And I plan on fighting them over this because if anything, I feel it should be undetermined. How do you get a, how do you come up with that diagnosis or that root, that cause by a person's sweat, sweatshirt being turned inside out? They don't want to go, they don't want to do the extra work. They don't want to do the extra work. So, and it's been like that, you know, I, I really tried to have their back all the months that she was missing. I, you know, I tried to stay in there, you know, not bad mouth them because, you know, obviously I'm not going to do that. They're, I need them to help me look for my daughter. I need them to investigate. And I believe that they did a decent job investigating, but I also believe there was a lot of frustration on their part. And I think they just gave up. And I honestly, truly believe that they just don't, I don't know if it's laziness or what. I don't know what the, the deal is. But now it's just like, oh, we found her kids close. Hypothermia. So it sounds like you're almost at a stalemate with them right now as far as moving forward. I, I, I am absolutely at a stalemate right now. You know. What are some of your questions or concerns or maybe theories that you'd like to see looked into um, surrounding Austin's case? I want to know how my daughter died. I would like Benjamin Garland to tell me how she died. I, one of my theories is that, you know, maybe something happened with, you know, when he robbed somebody for drugs or stole that car. Um, 
the people chasing after them. You know, there were some, there were different um, reports of, you know, Sally, when they went to make a phone call, Sally believed that somebody had been chasing them. She believed that Allison had possibly jumped out of a car. She, she said this to me, she looked as if she, like, one side of her was all muddy, like as if somebody had jumped out of a car, you know. Um, the car, the truck that, that he had stolen was drivable still, so why did he ditch it somewhere? And why were they, like, running through the woods and going through the woods, you know, knocking on people's doors, seeming scared and in shock? It's It's been now, what, four months, I think, uh, since Allison's remains were found, has Ben yeah. been cooperative at all? Talked about anything? Given any kind of help whatsoever to this point? Um, he talked to them when he first went to jail. He told them, you know, we separated around three o'clock on Sunday, and I never saw her again. Um, and then they talked to him one more time with his attorney present, and they told me that. He basically gave them kind of the same information, and but it was nothing that would lead them to where else. Was. So I don't really know if that's being cooperative or not. I don't believe it's being cooperative, but um, you know, his family hasn't been cooperative. You know, his family has not even reached out to offer condolences. No, his sister actually reached out and offered condolences, but his parents have never reached out. Nothing. You know, I, it's just it's it's frustrating. It, it seems frustrating that when someone that might be able to prov- provide answers just isn't willing to talk or not share much or share enough to help you get the answers you're looking for. No, it's very frustrating. I believe that in due time, um, I believe we will find out what happened to her. I hold on to that hope with everything I have that somebody will come forward and, you know, tell me how my daughter passed away, how she lost her life. You know, how did he, if they were both out there in the woods, how did he come out of there alive? And she didn't. Well, I hope something uh, that you're working on gets you the answers that you deserve. And if there's anyone out there that's responsible for Allison not being here, that, they are going to be held accountable one day. Um, in the meantime, again, on uh, John Gray and myself, we're going to continue to spread awareness for Allison's case. Uh, we want to advocate for answers uh, for you and your family on Three Minute Mystery, and we're going to help spread yeah. the word about what happened to her, and not let her be forgotten, uh, and let people know that there are a lot of questions uh, out there that still need answers. Right? Yeah, we need. We need, and I really. My family and myself, I thank you guys so much for your ongoing support and, you know, the love that you guys have shared and for Allison and, and our family. We appreciate it so very much, um, you know, and I, I believe that we can find the answers. Well, guys, uh, at this point, where would you focus if you were in Misty's shoes? I think she's probably on the right track. You, you got to get that ruling essentially overturned. I know, Gray, you have some experience with helping something like this happen in a case. Uh, what, do you, what do you think the odds are of that? How easy is that process? That's, it's not easy. You have to have somebody willing to change what they put on, as a ruling before. And a lot of times you have egos involved in that at, at that point. So it's hard to get a medical examiner to change what they they came up with, but a lot of times that can be from a detective's suggestion as well. They can come in and say, hey, you know, we were looking at it like this. If I gave you this information, would it make you think differently about what you see here? And then they might change it. And it's it's very difficult in that, in the other case, DJ Ficky case, I made a, a, a full video. It was, it was way easier to to make a case because all the information was just sitting right there in some interrogation videos. Yeah. Morph, any ideas? Yeah, I, I, it's a little bit frustrating. I think it's a, a, a tough road ahead. And I, I would 
encourage her to definitely get medical experts and try and uh, see if there's any evidence, any kind of clues that can be gained from uh, her Allison's remains and, and see if there's anything at all that can be determined there. Because short of that, um, I, and short of a witness coming forward with new information or Ben changing his story and suddenly becoming cooperative, it, it's going to be hard to, to move forward in, in any other direction. Yeah, I think, well, step number one, get a copy of the autopsy report yourself, which if they gave it that ruling, I don't know why she's having such a hard time getting that. Um, that'd be step number one. Step number two, I'd start running that through other experts to see if the analysis is fair, if it holds up, what their feedback on that is. And as a matter of fact, we know someone that might be able to help with that. Um, so we'll definitely keep in touch with Misty and see if we can uh, try to get that paperwork. And if we can get a copy of it, I know there's someone that I want to run it by. Um, to see if they can take a look at that analysis as well. And then basically just start trying to build the case from there. And if you get enough experts that say this, you know, this analysis doesn't hold up, um, maybe start pressing through some city officials, through the investigators, just trying to raise exposure to this. I don't, I feel like we haven't really hit the end of this yet. I think we've hit a stopping point. I know with last season, with season two, we basically jumped into a case that's kind of similar, just hit a, a total stopping point, and we're trying to push this boulder uphill. Um, but I don't think Misty's going to give up anytime soon, and I know that we're not going to give up on her. Yeah, well, the thing I was going to say one more thing here is that, um, you know, Misty is really fortunate to have such an amazing family behind her. I mean, Billy is like a... A bulldog. I mean, me and her have even butted heads a few times, but she really is out there yeah. advocating for the family. And Allison uh, worked tirelessly putting on searches. And I mean, it was really amazing to see. And it's, um, it's good to know that at least people out there are willing to work so hard. And she had so many people supporting her. And then, you know, the pandemic hit and then it sort of slowed down things. A little bit there um it, also what i would do is i think the key to the case is going to be charlie uh, ben courtney and ben's parents in yeah. that in that group of five people is the answer to the questions yeah you just have to dig through a lot to try to get to it if one of those stories is even close to the actual truth of what's going on. Missing persons cases frequently turn into a call for bringing people together and asking for help from your community. Some of the first people to step forward to answer those calls are families that have faced this themselves. And Michael O'Connell told us a story about a different girl that went missing and how someone from Allison's case stepped forward to help. Uh, about a month ago, in eastern Washington County, and the, I think they lived in the West Slope area. A young girl went missing. She had all kinds of serious physical and mental health problems. Her parents were beside themselves. Um, they were kind of getting the runaround from the police. She lived in Washington County, but she was last seen in Portland. Portland has their hands full dealing with the riots. Um, and the parents were trying to mount their own search effort on their own, much like what Misty had to do. Yep. And um, so I met with them, gave them what advice I could. And I actually had Misty come and meet with them and Misty explained to them the steps that they took in terms of organizing volunteer searchers and getting posters printed up and all that. And Misty was, was dynamite. Not only did she appreciate being involved in that kind of effort, but she was able to give them advice based on her experience that, you know, is hard to come across. 
Yeah. And uh, fortunately, and the reason they were they needed to do a lot of searching was that they believed their daughter was lost or purposely lost or disappeared in Forest Park, which is huge. Um, and then the the happy ending of that story is that uh, she was found alive. Maybe we'll still get a happy ending to this story someday. An organization that came forward to help Misty early on in this case was the Kyron Horman Foundation. Uh, to honor Allison, uh, we are making a donation to them in her name. And if any of you want to donate to that charity, it's the KyronHormanFoundation.org online. Allison's family is still looking for help with this case. If you have any tips to call in, please contact the Washington County Sheriff's Investigation Department at 593-846-2500. If you need to remain anonymous, please call Crime Stoppers of Oregon at 503-823-HELP. That's 503-823-4357. If you have any feedback, corrections, or new details, you can send them to us via email at 3men, that's with the number 3, at threemenandamystery.com. Or you can reach out to us on Twitter. Our handle is at Three Men and a Mystery. You can also find us on Facebook. Three Men and a Mystery is produced by John Lorden, Mike Morford, and Gray Hughes. Please be sure to rate us on the podcasting platform that you found us on and help us grow by telling your friends and family about us. Morph, Gray, thank you so much for all your help this season looking into this case and um, to everyone that gave their time and opened up with us to share information about Allison, to share how amazing she was and how so many people that she affected. Uh, thank you. And of course, a huge thank you to her family as well. But we also want to thank you. Thank you for listening to Tattooed Tears, the story of Allison Watterson and joining us on this investigation. I'm John Lorden. I'm Mike Morphin. And I'm Gray Hughes. And we are three men and a mystery. Mm-hmm.